Chiara Kozak, Tala Falava, Malo Alene, Malo Ni, Ulu Tomumai. Welcome to this time together. Two churches, three congregations, one family of believers and seekers, and some children busy with activities. You will be looking at them with eyes of envy. <laughs> we wish we were over there. We met out too. My name is Greg. Thank you to Reverend Robin for leading this time of worship and reflection with me. To another Robin, and to Grace, and to everyone from across the congregations who is going to read today. Friends, this is a thoughtful service on a day that is quite a hard one for many people. Good Friday is often thought to be the least favourite day in the church year. We're going to use a script today to help us think about the Good Friday events in a new way. Thank you for being with us and we welcome your energy. Everybody's energy contributes. Let's pause for a moment to be grateful for those people in our lives who support us and who are kind to us and who teach us. Some people who cannot be in church today and who are thinking of us right now. Those people we hold in prayer and all who might watch the service online afterwards. It's just pause to remember those people. And our children and young people in church and in other places, you and they, I God's blessing. Let's open with a song that has very powerful words. The words will be on the screen. Robin will sing to us. Thank you. 
We were joined together in prayer. We gather and encourage this sense of love and grace in the environment of our lives. But we remain faithful in our loyalty of God and justice in our world. We gather today to be a witness to suffering and death on our cross. We are all the injustice and cruelty of such a thing. This is our story. My name is 
his kingdom, and in the disciples were really with Jesus while he was praying. It's hard to express the level of fear and hatred that came over me when I saw those soldiers. I loved Jesus so much that I had to do something. I had to show my loyalty and my devotion. So I raised my sword. I meant to do so much more, but all I managed to do was cut off the ear of one of the soldiers. I was desperate to protect Jesus, but resorted to exactly the kind of thing Jesus warned us against. Jesus hasn't forgotten violence. He reached out and he healed the soldier, one of his enemies. Everything fell apart before my eyes. It was inconceivable that Jesus would allow himself to be taken prisoner. But he did. I was sickened by the realisation that I had betrayed God's Son to his enemies. I was desperate. I couldn't undo what I had started. I had betrayed my Lord. I had returned his love with betrayal. I didn't deserve to live. What else could I do? <coughs> this Jesus surrendered with a courage like I've never seen. There was something about him I couldn't understand. He carried no weapon. But when he came to where to ask, he, we became terrified. A troop of armed Roman soldiers paralyzed with fear and I was so embarrassed. But what else could I do? I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe what was happening. I promised Jesus I wouldn't deny him, but that night I denied him three times. I bitterly wept because of it, and I was deeply sorry. But I, we, all of us were so scared, we fled and didn't know what to do. We were in constant fear. After Jesus was arrested that night, he was given six trials, all without witnesses and all at night. They were brutal and cruel to him. Long before he went to the cross, Jesus was humiliated and beaten. He was all alone. His disciples were nowhere to be found. And I'm a chief priest, a man of prestige and political influence. Our relationship with this Jesus is complex. I wonder how we'll be judged in the future. Whether people will understand what has been going on in these times. I notice that despite our efforts to discredit Jesus, he never defended himself or tried to get revenge. But that voice, that voice pierced my heart. Perhaps I knew deep down that he was a man of God. But I didn't want to admit it. What else could I have done?
I'm conscious violence. Personally, I had nothing against him, although he was known as a troublemaker among his own people. Certainly, as a Roman ruler, I didn't care whether he lived or died. I was curious to hear him, though. He seemed to have a depth and a power about him. I must admit, I came to think of him as a man of truth. Why was he to die? I felt reluctant to let him go, but I'm not sure why. There was something so unusual about him that I had to job to do this. I am a very beautiful woman, I am I not? Pontius Pilate is my husband, a very powerful and influential man, and I am a very important woman. Something happened to me, though, that scared me to the inner depths of my being. God spoke to me about Jesus. He did it in a dream at night, and from then on, tried to warn my, I tried to warn my husband about Jesus. Besides that, there was something about his eyes that bothered me. They were the kind of eyes that see right through him. I wanted my husband to leave him alone and release him. I didn't feel he was someone we should be dealing with. But what else could I do? Losing faith and being embarrassed in front of the people was unacceptable. What really bothered me was that this Jesus actually seemed to care about me. I didn't want to admit it, but I didn't want his death to be my responsibility. So in front of the screaming, shouting mob, I washed my hands of the situation. What else could I do?
My name is Joseph of Arimathea. That Jesus, I was so frightened. If someone had found out, I'd lose my reputation and position. I'm a wealthy man, and this was a big risk. But someone I knew, somehow I knew that such a holy man should not be thrown into a pit. He changed my life. He told me the truth. Opening my family tomb was an expression of gratitude for how much he had changed my life. After all, that's the way love is. It transforms people to do things for love of truth rather than for fear. What else could I do? I'm a centurion, part of the Roman squad assigned to Golgotha that day, and I saw Jesus die. I was just doing my job. I saw so many people die, more crucifixions than I can count. But you get used to it. Besides, it's what we do. But this Jesus, he changed me. It was something out of the way he died. Call it an inner peace or something. In spite of the pain, there was something about him. He even had the audacity to forgive the detachment carrying out this execution. Who does that? I do think he was special somehow. I wish I had known more about him. I still feel bad about the participating in Thank you. 
What can I say? How can I ever hate the son to him? He must know that I love him with all my heart. What more could I have done? And am I willing to risk my life for his truth? Can I still call him my Lord? I know I've been given a gift, a gift of love so great that I would gladly give my life for the sake of my child. Maybe there are things that I could have done differently, but I couldn't have loved him more. I always wondered if there was more that I could have done. But then none of the twelve even showed their faces when he was killed. Sad how the same bumpkins who busied themselves arguing about who would be first in the kingdom were absent that day, cowering somewhere safe during his last hours. I hope he knew when he looked at me how much I loved him. I will never leave him. I will never betray his truth. Is that what love is? We're used to thinking about Good Friday as a series of actions leading up to the point at which to use the words from John's Gospel, Jesus declares, it is finished. The narrative is long and full of detail. The actions are dark, ominous. Today, and thank you readers, thank you all, we've been able to focus on why the passion story is so intense. It's because of the emotional states at play alongside the events we normally read on Good Friday. So we've got in under the action. What are the people in the story thinking? The questions, the regrets, the avoidances, the excuse making the sense of consequences and the realisation that no act is without an impact. Everything produces an outcome, whether or not we had expected it. Have you noticed, perhaps when we were saying a prayer together, that each year Good Friday seems to gather in the current hurt that is top of mind. So last year in this, the suffering and betrayal in the story seem to find the plight of Ukraine. In past times, it has been other countries, whole continents, <coughs> circumstances of injustice and violence shaded into the bleakness of the state. And each year the prayers of intercession sprinkle in a few examples of the countless and so often unnamed hurts that burden humanity. The song based on Isaiah 53 I found very moving. Thank you, Robin, for bringing the song to us today. The words, we despised him, we disowned him, though he clearly hurt and suffered. When I was looking at those words, you know, I couldn't help thinking of bullying. Bullying on the world stage. And social policy that protects colonisation. Across those online empires of which we have become subjects. The Facebook, Twitter, the rest. In workplaces 
ourselves as victims and ourselves even as perpetrators. At school, among our children, kids have always been bullies. I've heard people say that. Kids have always been bullies. And why is that? Because adults taught them to be. No one born in the image and likeness of God inherits bullying as a God gene. We learn to do it. Doesn't Good Friday make us think? The stories we tell and the stories we hear reflect upon each other because we are creative beings and our brains assemble details to find and interweave themes in common. Maybe it's only through the stories and patterns that we can contemplate suffering. Limitless, unstructured hurt challenges us. It's why the damage done to the young and vulnerable, that inexplicable damage to the truly innocent, so confronts us and can even destabilise our faith. Friends, to put some shape to hurt, violence and betrayal is not to make it excusable or insignificant, but it enables us to look upon it, contemplate it and reject it. Jesus chose not to return violence, but to forgive it. And let's take seriously today the story of ourselves the story of each of us met in our lifetimes by the God not remote from human experience. It is finished, said Jesus. Not in the sense of it's all over. Jesus means everything has come to completion. It has reached its end point. It has been achieved. He speaks from within the reality of humanity as part of creation, giving voice to life that will not be extinguished by death. Jesus speaks into our story his message of completeness. That, to quote the late Colin Gibson, nothing is lost on the breath of God. Nothing that happens or could happen is beyond the presence of the one, of life. And Jesus focused on the one, on the ultimate relationship that motivated all his actions and words. Friends, right now in our own story, alert to emotions and questions swirling in the truth of us, let's make the choice to look again and steadily for the light that beckons us. For we have seen that light, we know we have. We've seen it sometimes. And if you can't see it today, perhaps you could make the decision to look once more, just once more, as far as the horizon and also within. Let us all know that the way shown by Jesus is a call to become whole, focused on the love at the core of our being, the love that is giving and expansive, inexplicable, yet achievable, because Jesus showed it. It has been achieved. That's the blueprint. It's our birthright. That love is our destiny. The love Jesus embodied to show us the way. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Ta 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 ta. 
Jesus, Son of God. You died with arms outstretched upon a cross. And we pray for the world where you are crucified each day with the destitute, the oppressed, the dispossessed. Jesus, Son of God, you died for us falsely accused, mocked and condemned to death. And we pray for all who govern, those who make and administer law. We pray for those who are bullied and for all who are denied justice. Jesus, Son of God, you died for us, denied, deserted and rejected by those you loved. And we pray for all who feel the hurt of rejected love, the pain of betrayal and abandonment. <coughs> Jesus, Son of God, you died for us to show your steadfast love for your people. And we pray for all who live or work in this community, our families, our friends, and all whom we love. And Jesus, Son of God, you died for us to bring healing, wholeness, and new life to your people. We pray for those in sickness, sorrow, grief, or pain, and for all who are close to death. Jesus, Son of God, you died for us with arms outstretched upon a cross. We remember all who have been condemned to die, and all who have died in pain and torment. With the women who loved you and ministered to you, and with the disciple whom you loved, may we stand with you this day. And at our life's end, forgive us, and our desertions and betrayals and stretch out your arms to receive us that with all your saints we may live with you in paradise amen beloved disciple. And on that day there were three faithful people. Here today we have many more from all around the world and we are part of the family of Christ all around the world. 
So I say to you, in the name of Jesus, peace be with you. And also, and also with, with you. you. Would you turn to your neighbour and give them a greeting of peace? extinguish the ones on the table at the front. It's traditional on Good Friday that the service ends simply and without music we just leave the church in silence. So what we're going to do is extinguish the candles. We'll leave those ones burning and we'll go through to the hall and we'll say good morning again, talofa again. We will uh, enjoy each other's company over a cup of tea or coffee. Who would like to come and put out the remaining candles for me? Spencer, would you like to come and put out the candles? Would you like to do that? Julia would too. Right. That was a race. I've got something special today. You haven't used this before, have you? You think you have? No, I'm not sure. Okay. Well, you cover it. You cover to You do one. Okay. You do these two, and then I'll get Spencer to do two. This candle. Yep. And that one. Very good. That's good. I think you have used it before because I explained it to Spencer. Right? Don't pass the snuffer to Spencer. Thank you, Spencer. And you can do that big one there. And this one up here. Then that one, 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 one. hold it down, hold it, to hold it. There we go. Oh, hold it. One more, and then the last one here for Julia. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, smoke. Anyone outside will think that we've elected a new pope or something. <laughs> 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 So friends, go forth in peace, go forth in faith, go forth in hope. Look forward to Easter Day. But live in this day and take our companionship with us from this space. God gives us. <laughs>